And then the other significant message was a final message he sent of some description to the Jordan Peterson blue tick, for want of a better phrase, Instagram account managed by his PR team. And despite the best efforts of the PSNI and the Jordan Peterson management, we don't know what that message was. I'm Nicola Talent, and you're listening to Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the sins of the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. The opinion of a psychiatric report prepared for the coroner investigating the death of teenager Noah Donoghue is that he died from suicide while struggling with his sexuality and having built up an obsession with controversial psychologist Jordan Peterson. But his mum Fiona Donoghue has rejected the conclusion. But it does give a fascinating insight into what was going on in young Noah's life in the run-up to his death. Today, I'm joined by Dublin-based journalist Donal McIntyre, who's heading up an independent investigation into the case and who has seen the high-level report. We discuss the bright and ambitious Noah, the last messages he sent to friends and his fascination with Peterson, down to the last communication to the YouTube star on Instagram. We also discuss his crowdfunder for the independent Noah Donoghue investigation and how he hopes it will hit its target. This is Crime World, a podcast from sundayworld.com. So the big story that has broken today in the Sunday World, Donald, is further revelations from your own investigation into the death of Noah Donoghue. And you have had sight of a incredibly uh, interesting report um, which was prepared for the coroner. Now, this is a report, it has to be said, it was um, commissioned by the coroner and for the inquest. And it was an interesting report by a leading academic and uh, and also by a leading um, uh, psychiatrist. And uh, when he was commissioned, his job was effectively to use all the paperwork given to him by the PSNI, you know, close to 500 pages, and to make an assessment of the, st- uh, of the state of Noah's mind and what happened uh, in this bizarre, extraordinary, and uh, we'll never forget a tragic case, loss of life of a beautifully super smart, incredibly generous, warm heart that was Noah. So that was his task. Um, and in retrospect, it's quite interesting interesting reflecting upon it, um, uh, he he was uh, perhaps at one hand be- tied behind his back, because as much as the PSNI did not reveal to the family uh, about uh, Noah's secret walkabout trip at 3.30 in the morning and returning at 4.05, um, the coroner, who may or may not have known, uh, but certainly the PSNI, when this expert was being commissioned, did not say to the court, Perhaps we should hold back because we have another line of inquiry, which would be very useful. One would have thought absolutely essential to consider the the matrix of Noah's mindset and mental health at that time. In any case, he went ahead without any knowledge of that, which to my mind uh, is surprising. It's also worth noting that that was delivered in November 2021. By now, we're coming up to September. uh, There was supposed to be an inquest in September. So the inquest was supposed to be over by now. Nonetheless, he still is none the wiser and his report remains the same. But he comes out and sensationally, and I would say curiously, and certainly the family will have a very different view of this, and says, number one, Noah took his own life uh, and made a plan effectively to do so. And at first blush, this looks a very controversial view And uh, at second blush, to my mind, it also looks like a very controversial view. But um, uh, he's a very eminent and smart man, and he brings in certain strands, which I think paint a picture of Noah's mindset, uh, the fact he was an incredibly deep thinker, uh, the the psychological kind of rabbit holes and and storylines and narratives and mindset he was in at the time. But I think his conclusions I would disagree with. And I think it's important when people you know listen to us here and read the story in the uh, Sunday world is that they recognize the family also will have their own uh, psychiatrist to give, I suspect, a very alternative tale. And to set the scene of June 2020 and cast our minds back to that time that we don't really like going to, but it was lockdown time and the kids were home from school. Um, You know, the world was in a sort of a place of disarray. 
Um, the North perhaps didn't have such strict lockdowns as we had in the South. But nonetheless, the kids of his age were seen as and often if you speak to people in the education um people working in education, they will often say that kids around the 14, 15 sort of age group were, you know, strongly affected by that. I think it's very true. And I, Noah was a lockdown child. And I think perhaps, you you know, I think there was some semblance that he, he, he did handle, by and large, according to the reports, and I think it's noted in the report, lockdown pretty well. But towards the end of lockdown, towards the end, and as we came closer to the 21st of June, 2020, you know, he was having blue periods, what teenager doesn't, low moods, what teenager occasionally doesn't. So um, uh, how significant were they? Well, how and how relevant are they in fact to the events which were to follow, you know, it, it, was his mental health relevant? Was it a factor? And that's part of the uh, the reason why I wrote the report and part and uh, part of the conclusions. I think what's really interesting: the lockdown time allowed and afforded people to go in and to delve in a little more time on their own, a little more introspective, and also doing lines of study and investigation. And and uh, when the whole planet and humanity was at risk. From this virus, it's it's no wonder why somebody like Noah would then began to understand the nature of existence, why we're here, the nature of God, and then to explore and seek out one of the key figures in Noah's life at that time, which was of course Jordan Peterson. And this is the Canadian controversial, incredibly bright academic who has um, really espoused traditional values, right, and has anchored himself in metaphors and allegories from the past and from biblical studies. And, and a whole range of kind of historical moments to kind of center the world in his view, his campaign to end chaos and to offer certainty and plans and projection. Uh, and so we can adequately, you know, project our futures and plan our futures. So um, what we do know, and this I think report does distill this rather well, discuss Jordan Peterson and uh, perhaps in part Noah's relationship with Jordan Peterson in his uh, final days. Yeah, and there's there's bits that from the report that you have seen. I mean, you and I spoke earlier in the week and uh, in relation to this, he had the book, the Jordan Peterson book, The Twelve Rules of Life. He is at one point quoting it to friends and he meets a friend and he speaks to him kind of at length about this book. His mother reports that he barely puts it down in the last week of uh, before he, he disappeared. Um, and some of the communications he's having in the text that you have seen and that you you shared with my with me they are certainly related to Peterson's work um when I went on to look at his podcast stuff now there's no evidence in this or there's no suggestion in this report that he was listening to podcasts the reason I thought about it was that he had those headphones on of course didn't he when he was going out cycling out the the or in the early hours of the morning before he disappeared uh, and Sure enough, on the 21st of June, um, an episode dropped from Jordan Peterson. It was part of his biblical series, which seemed to have been dropping every couple of days. They were very lengthy interviews, uh, sorry, lectures, really, based on uh, stories from the ancient Bible, from, from Genesis. And that particular day, what dropped was titled Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I listened to a little bit of it. <laughs> And Peterson talks about uh, in it, it's a, it, he's bringing sort of Sodom and Gomorrah, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and really turning that into the story of change, making changes in your life. And he talks about change having to be something sort of almost that hurts, like a tattoo is a physical thing that hurts. He talks about, you know, that we in, in, in modern society often say, I'm going to give up cigarettes, but we never do it. Or I'm going to change in January, but we never do. So he talks about having to make a sacrifice really for real change to happen. And look, uh, millions of people could listen to that and it will mean nothing. Do you know what I mean? It'll be bubblegum to them. Um, not judging what Peterson is saying and trying to link it. But he, I mean, there's no doubt from this uh, psychiatric report that um, Noah Donoghue is is listening and, and, and eating in, up intently Peterson's content. 
that we don't literally have to listen to the psychiatric report. And it's important to note that as opposed to most psychological autopsies, his job was to do a paper analysis. He didn't speak to any of the family, he, none of the cousins, friends, teachers. He saw reports and very, and, and they don't necessarily delve into the detail or he's not able to ask the right questions. We, of course, are. And, and um, so everything that the psychologist said about Noah's obsession and fascinating and interest in Peterson, his mom had recognized and was very inured to. And she certainly, when she recognized his low mood, she she recognized, well, if you're interested in this, I'll get you the book. And she got him the book and, and, and it allowed him to do deep thinking. And there's nothing inherently kind of radical or dangerous. This isn't a cult. This is not something, you know, uh, you know, uh, nobody's drinking the Kool-Aid here, right? It's not Jimmy, Jimmy, it's not uh, 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 Jonestown. This is a, this is a very rational and super bright, uh, albeit controversial, um, uh, I would say, right-wing uh, kind of philosopher. He's right-wing and is very anti-gender identity. Yeah, um, well, it's very, yeah, it's very traditional. I think it's the easiest thing without going down a rabbit hole, just very traditional, and very formal, and there's plenty to pick apart and and uh, somebody has said it's kind of Andrew Tate light you know so you could go down that line if you want to and I, he's and, and uh, but that's not doesn't it's not helpful here I think what is interesting is here there's two things one is that in the report crucially uh he suggests uh and I think I wouldn't agree with him on this uh, but of course, he's had limited knowledge and access to the people in Noah's world, uh, as opposed to me. And his mother obviously wouldn't agree. He suggests that somehow Noah was struggling with his sexual identity. And this was uh, 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 certainly a surprise to everybody uh, um, who read the report. And um, uh, and it was a kind of shock. And I think it's kind of outlier. And he, and he makes references to the Sodom and Gomorrah and that kind of sexuality uh, and homosexuality references and that as being one of the the fact that Noah was referencing that and had done some internet searches related to that, then somehow that reflected upon his sexuality. Another thing, he also noted uh, uh, that um, he discussed coming out. Now, I've looked at those text messages and the coming out equally and much more likely was referring to the boys coming out for a trip rather than any phrase. It's as banal and innocuous as that. If you're looking for the connections, you'll find the connections. The connections didn't really resonate with me. The third thing which he placed out there uh, was there was a, some hint about denial and a truth and uh, about searching a deeper truth and meaning in life. And that is broad brush uh, uh, Peterson, it, it, uh, to my mind, rather than a reflection on his internal gender or sexuality. Uh, 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 so I, so again, I don't put as much weight in that as, as the, uh, the psychiatrist did. But the fourth thing was, and again, I think this is a mistaken interpretation, and I think it was overinflated and accidentally overinflated. He mentions that there were, um, the word gay was daubed on a homework yearbook a book from St. Malachy's, um, and that it was written by various people. The key thing about various people is that it means there was bullying multiple people. In fact, actually, that never was the case. It was a one-off instance uh, some time during the year, although it, uh, it's written uh, across a couple of pages uh, in, in early March 2020, it could have been written at any stage. But basically, it's a kind of prank kids do. It was one off. And certainly none of his friends, and certainly he, and certainly none of the school, and nowhere else in any of his social media or internet connections and, and communications, is there any hint that he was being bullied because of any uh, problem or crisis with his, with his sexuality? Moreover, um, uh, his communications with his pals were the sweetest. This was a beautiful group of a friendship group, gentle, supportive, kind. You know, it was incredibly kind of, uh, you know, it was really uplifting to see this child at the center of this small friendship group. And, and they were so sweet and supportive. And I'm thinking, God, wow, this does give you great hope for the future generation, sadly, of which Noah will not be part of. But his other friends, certainly, they're just remarkable. And it was it nearly brought a tear to one's eye. But most importantly, you know, is that as uh, as Fiona has said, he was always brought up 
in an open uh, discussions about sexuality and gender and to celebrate everybody's differences. And it would have to be no problem if he was gay or not. It just simply was not, wouldn't have registered uh, as, a, as a problem in that household and in the community and in the world that she brought him into and always fostered. So it seems to me that um, while the psychiatrist, you know, made very valid associations with, you know, uh, other issues, about chaos and order uh, and maybe you know the fact that he he threw himself immersed himself into this jordan peterson stuff and all the kind of biblical themes and religiosity that actually um that was one track and i i think that it was completely irrelevant to any gender issue which i did, don't think uh really was sustainable i think there really is another interesting beat from that which isn't discussed in his report and uh, it's mentioned in passing and it's this his two last vital communications which i think we both having discussed we think this are potentially key if we knew knew the context of them they might open up a little bit more about his motivation state of mind and uh or any planning if there was any planning and it's this um, there was a text message which he sent to a friend at 4.10 a.m. in the morning, and this is significantly um, just after he returned to his flat after a, a secret walkabout uh, in, in Belfast city centre, unbeknownst to his mother, and of course, which was kept from the family and the public for over two and a half years. And so divine comedy, what are we to make of this? And then the other significant message was a final message he sent of some description to the Jordan Peterson blue tick, for want of a better phrase, Instagram account managed by his PR team. And the, despite the best efforts of the PSNI and the Jordan Peterson management, we don't know what that message was. Now, let's see uh, the significance of this, and maybe they're connected. So let's look at Divine Comedy, LOL. Is this a reference to the, uh, uh, the Dante's, you know, biblical journey into discovery and hell and heaven and uh, the epic 13th century Italian poem, one of the greatest works of literature? Is this a reference to the... And something that's regularly, Donal, uh, referred to during Peterson's talks on Dante's Inferno. We know that Noah was definitely, you know, engulfed in a lot of Peterson's talks and his teachings and, um, you know, his lectures. So, you know, it is, it, it's a strange message for a 14 year old to send at 4 10 in the morning with no reference, but it's it, the, the message is simply the text to one of his best pals, Divine Comedy, LOL. And I think you're absolutely right, but I think let's let's investigate and add the other possibilities. Is this about the video game related to it? Dante's Inferno, a 2010 kind of video game, or is it related to the Northern Irish band of the same name? Let's look at all those possibilities. Mm. And if we look at the, fi the fact that he was obsessed with Jordan Peterson, and then if he recognised he sent his message off at three, his last ever communication, um, other than the conversation he had with his mom, if we're to think about that, um, then uh, we have to say, you know, what is it most likely be, uh, going to reference? More likely than not, in all probability, I would seem that would be a reference to Jordan Peterson. It would be a reference to his works. And I was looking online this morning and I saw uh, um, Jordan Peterson wax very lyrically about a very complex and deep dream he had about Dante's Inferno. And this, we know that many of his last internet searches over the days and perhaps a week before the fateful bicycle journey of the, of the 21st of June were about Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson and Joe Rogan, Jordan Peterson and his partner, Jordan Peterson podcast, Cast. You know, this is a guy who was exploring and he also had all the time in the world. And his mom did state that, she, you know, this was locked down, but she was working. She was a key worker. And so not only uh, um, was he at home, but he was at home alone. And also he didn't get enough, uh, get much opportunity because outside uh, where he lived, it was a big, you know, uh, problem with heroin addicts and sale of drugs pretty openly, a problematic area. So neither she nor, o uh, nor Noah felt safe about him going out of the house mm. at that time, you know, during lockdown. So, um, it, you know, there are fascinating connections. So you can picture that the amount of time. I mean, we all spend more time in front of our computers than we normally would. Um, 
And you can just you can just picture that scenario. And I think we all probably got interested in things that we we didn't have time for before. Maybe I think it's important to note that on the day Noah went missing um, and your investigations, uh, which have revealed this report, have found that his Internet searches on the very day included these ancient biblical terms. Now, I had to look these up. I wouldn't have had a clue what they were. The tree of Moray, uh, a place where messages from God were received by Abraham and others. This is again back to Genesis, to the the old Bible. Bethel was a place where Abraham found a ladder to heaven. He he searched for a place called Negev, Negev, which is a desert where ancient people developed techniques to conserve water. Another place called the Land of Ai, which was con- conquered by the Israelites. I mean, were they things that were mentioned in Peterson's book in his lectures? And was he checking what the meanings of them were? Or was he looking for was he looking further into this sort of uh, philosophical and theological sort of world that he was drawn to? I mean, clearly, you know, if this was played a part in his tragic demise, it was kind of he's nearly a victim of his own intelligence and a victim of, of, of lockdown. We, I think in his journey and in his story, there's a couple of things we have to be be, be wary of. Uh, first of all, um, there may be very well a separation between any mental health issues and what happens subsequently. Uh, if you're vulnerable, you're much more likely to be, to be uh, a victim of some kind of uh, crime, perhaps, um, or interference or engagement, uh, nefarious engagement, uh, often uh, uh, on the same continuum many times. So if you if you take his journey, um, so so even if he had a mental health issues, it doesn't obviate the necessity or the possibility that there was third party involvement, which I know has been uh, something the police and the coroner certainly dismissed. Uh, and um, the, it is problematic in the fact that there are key opportunities for the PSNI to thwart that possibility by actually doing proper uh, forensics on key exhibits, which they didn't do. Uh, it's important to differentiate this mental health issue with uh, the other possibility of perhaps later on third party involvement. We don't know. We know there are key parts of his journey which which are missing in CCTV, which we would all want and hope were out there, which would uh, offer some confidence and assuage any public concerns over potential third party involvement. We know uh, that there's CCTV uh, of him cycling naked and CCTV of him going down into Northwood and Northwood Road and um, some parts are missing. So there are CCTV it doesn't show him show him divesting himself of his clothes. It shows him cycling naked and and off we go. Um, you can certainly kind of paint a picture, which I think the psychiatrist was attempting to paint as a possibility, but said needed more work was, of course, that maybe Noah, you know, had in some confabulated kind of mindset uh, um, uh, and mental health issue had basically took on board the religiosity and some crusade and all of this. It, it was not very well uh, uh, explained, but he opens the possibility uh, that uh, Noah, this may have led Noah to water, to a strange place, and he may have accidentally passed away um, and drowned uh, without third party uh, um, intervention. Well, the point is, is it not that he doesn't say that happened accidentally? He couples that in the report with this sort of suicidal ideology on the basis of he was thinking about coming out of being gay and that that was something that possibly didn't sit well with the Peterson philosophy of where the world should be. I mean, it's a complex theory, but it is, I think, from that report, it is it is it is cited as one possible explanation, but it's explained as a suicide. And is that a suicide if somebody's thinking or having a mental well, first break? Of all, he does say I explicitly, I believe this is likely suicide. And then he knocks out the accidental line. He doesn't engage in any which way, any possibility of any third party involvement. And, you know, he said he's had no engagement with the family. This is predicated on the fact that he is struggling with his sexuality. There is no evidence from his family, his friends, any texts, all his, you know, personal, you know, um, uh, internet searches, that there was any hint of that. So, you know, to my mind is, you know, if there's no hint of it, you know, it's like, you know, you are really 
kind of pick out your own way around this simply because of, you know, primarily because of one mistaken interpretation of the word gay, which he believed was a bullying narrative, which it wasn't. It was just one person and one event. So I think it's predicated on the wrong uh, position, uh, 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 which is basically that there was an issue around sexuality, which there wasn't. I think move that to one side, then I don't think, um, then you have maybe a kid who is down the cul-de-sac of, of, of Jordan Peterson's writings at a difficult time in lockdown and kind of handicapped by how bright he was and his mm. exploratory and curiosity around this journey. So I think um, that the Peterson angle, I think, has merit. And I respectfully, me and I understand the family really reject that suicide line uh, as it's pretty because there was no planning. You know, mm. this is a kid who planned everything. It's a kid who went off with his favorite books and possessions. And he, you know, he, he there was no intention and no hint. Now, it does, it's not always the case that people who take their own lives, you know, have planning. But he suggests that this was precipitated in a stressor with his his concerns and, and confusion over his sexuality. We don't see that. Uh, we see no planning. Um, if you were going to take your own life, you wouldn't do it this way. There's no plan. He had, as Clive Driscoll said to me, he's a very experienced detective and has and sadly investigated many, many suicides, young and old. He said, listen, in my experience, you know, if you are going to plan this, well, you know, he didn't know anything about that part of the city. He knew nothing about storm drains. He couldn't even know if it was locked or open or whether he could get into it or not. So uh, certainly, uh, I, for me, I don't buy. But we have a whole team of experts who will have their own opinions. Some might support, some might not. But for me, it, it, where I am sitting right now, I am more with Clive Driscoll, uh, Detective Clive Driscoll. Uh, and of course, I'm more with the family who perhaps knew him best. Of course, knew him best. And what you're saying is that all these elements clearly are there is a bit of a low mood there there's other elements involved and the peterson one particularly he is a very deep thinker what stood out for me was you know that he was this straight a student that was planning god love him to go to trinity to study medicine that was what he he had actually do you know he'd actually google trinity college the the day he went missing. And the thing about yeah. it is when someone is planning to take their own life, they're they're foreshortening. They don't see beyond the next day. They they're not Googling, you know, university. Mm. And and he is saying, and he and I think we picked up on this, he is saying in his own words to his friends, you know. He's Googling Trinity College Dublin, where he wanted to do medicine. Undoubtedly, for sure, he'd have got in. The second thing is he's saying to his mates, I don't want to be in a dead end job because I went to a Peterson event and he talks about the choices we make and about the sacrifices. Now, the sacrifice, it's not some biblical sacrifice, giving up your, your life to make a better yeah. life. What it is, is giving up your time and making choices, the opportunity cost between you spending three hours studying at night or going out and have a drink with your pals, improving yourself, self-improvement. Remember, ultimately, he's a self-improvement guru. He's not a end your life guru. He's not a drink the Kool-Aid, give up here. Of course not. But I suppose, you know, your state of mind when you're listening to things is what is crucial here, isn't it? And how you're taking it. And in, in the report, I think the psychiatrist actually refers to that. It's how perhaps Noah perceived what Peterson was saying, you know, and that can be the difference, can't it? If somebody who's healthy and well is listening, they can hear what he is really saying. But I mean, I, it's to, I mean, listen, in our investigative team, we have a specialist adolescent psycho uh, psychologist. We have a specialist forensic psychiatrist, and they will. I'll talk this out with them now that this report is coming into the public domain. The second thing mm. is, I think you have to remember <clears throat> that this is an esteemed psychiatrist, but there were objections made at the inquest, the pre-trial hearings uh, along these lines. One. Dearest Joe uh, McCriskin, the, the coroner, why are you selecting an adult psychiatrist when this was an adolescent? And, you know, in the specialisms in this field, uh, you know, there's no doubt, you know, to Rome, you give unto Rome. To adolescents, you give unto that specialism, not an adult specialist. Also, he was an expert in suicide. 
And, you know, in, in, a, in a highly contested arena, you know, the concern which was raised in the court, well, we're a bit concerned, you're going to prejudge this, the family's solicitors said, you know, because, you know, in, in, in slang parlance, if you get the suicide guy and you ask him for an opinion, don't be surprised if he comes back with a suicide verdict. And I, that's respectfully, that's not to denude this eminent, eminent, hugely eminent mm. and, and, and brilliant psychiatrist. But to my mind also, you know, you have to factor in is that, you know, would an adolescent psychiatrist have a better take on this, you know, and I would think, well, that's why it's called a specialism, you know, but that's not to den denude him of his expertise mm. and his view. The key thing is this, you know, this is a subjective, it's psychiatry, it's psychology, it still is. Uh, and there are answers and questions, uh, there are questions, uh, answers to questions, which we'll never know for sure in relation to this. But uh, I think uh, it's important, it, it, you know, this may be uh, a, a tragic case of a uh, confused child in lockdown. Uh, this, the key points about third party intervention, missing CCTV, the issues about, um, and key issues about how Noah did he enter the drain? How did he enter the drain? If he was in the drain, could he have got from A to B where he was found? Um, when did he die? Yeah. Was he alive while the search teams were still looking for him? Mm -hmm. Is it possible for his body to be in that condition when uh, um, uh, in the first autopsy, in that condition, you know, uh, having uh, traversed in the dark all sorts of obstacles and chains, uh, you know, in the in that route, a 950 meter route in, in the storm drain from Linear Park down to that uh, uh, the the storm drain where he was ultimately found, a little basket of water in uh, uh, close to the shore road. So there are lots of other questions, but for sure, around the start of his journey. You know, yeah. and I think it's so complex. This is one of the a key uh, report in consideration of certainly his mind, his motivation and his mental health. I noticed as well there was a suggestion that there had been Skype calls perhaps on the on that day, but that there was no indication certainly given to the psychiatrist who those calls were with or what was the content of them. Um, have you know? Do you know if there are like? I mean, obviously you don't record Skype calls, but. There should be some sort of a record, should there not, of, of what's on the computer? Well, I think the PS and I have done a full forensic call and then they did it initially. And then they, they and they, they said that they delivered all the evidence and then they came back and they said, oh, we need to do some more. And so there's a bit of a confusion over this, you know, but how, you know, whether they've been. Perhaps they decided, well, it's not proportional for us to do a deep dive. And then they realized it's a very contentious case. We have to dig deeper and deeper. At the moment, I haven't seen um, additional references for that. But undoubtedly, if they're out there, the inquest, which will be the final official arbiter. Now, official. Now, the, arb the role of a coroner is the oldest in the UK and uh, the oldest in the UK justice system, one of the oldest roles going back to the thir uh, 1300s. Uh, and it's a very independent and, uh, you know, they're they're full of all sorts of interesting characters. But for me as a journalist, I, you know, I will listen to what the inquest has to say, but that's not the final verdict on it. it will well, Undoubtedly, it will be, this will be contested, but it'll be, there certainly will be more information to come. And I've no doubt that the PS and I, if they were to act as they've done with, I think, a kind of shadow investigation on the side in relation to this, this CCTV, if they held back from an expert, if they held it back from the family for two and a half years, it will be of no surprise to me, or indeed, I'm sure the family's lawyers, if they're holding back more material, will they'll drop like grenades, for what purpose, I don't know, into the inquest at the last moment. The schedule at the moment is that there's another hearing in September and they'll discuss uh, further CCTV application the family want to see and the PS and I are resisting. And of course, they'll, they want to get rid of all these procedural and disclosure issues before they start it. My best guesstimate of an inquest and we clearly respect the coroner's role and we respect um, his, his office. Uh, but as I said in the tweet recently, he's not God, you know, but he's God in his courtroom. We get that. So uh, we, you know, and he's made a very good decision, I think, uh, uh, certainly in his interest to have a jury uh, um, inquest. But um, looking, he did suggest at the very outset that we may never 
truly know. And in a way, you know, while there's so many, you know, fears around talking about suicide. I mean, there's there's been advice for years that that you, you don't really you don't really use the word too, too much in the media. You know what I mean? And And I don't know, in a way, have we completely and utterly stopped the conversation around it? And it is undoubtedly, especially for young kids, the age of Noah and around those sort of ages, it's it's like it's a huge killer of kids. And is it is it suicide if somebody's having a mental break if they don't know what they're doing? Is it still called that in law or is it is there another phrase? Well, well I'm not. Too, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I think we all know families who, who do not believe who've lost a loved one, but do not believe and will never believe that they planned to do what they did. They they cannot ever have peace with it. They they can't understand that this person that was happy and jovial and, and fine one minute is gone the next and that they somehow planned it. And I think, you know, I think more and more people sort of have a bit of comprehension that maybe people are having a complete disassociation. They're having a moment that they're completely and utterly not in reality when they're carrying out these actions. I think that's very understandable, but that's also, it's kind of, but it's less kind of rational if somebody's left behind a note or if they've taken a traditional route to take their mm. own life. In this instance, uh, um, you know, uh, there, there just is no route. There's no planning. It's so haphazard. So if it's anything you, you might relate it to mental health, it would just be a state of confusion. People in a state of confusion put themselves in harm's way all the time. So 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 that's what happens. In the sep- I think it's separately because I don't want to confabulate it too much it, because I, I I don't think there's enough evidence to suggest in any which way this is a suicide. But in any case, I do think we should be hugely more open about the conversation growing up uh, the you know kids in the, uh, and growing up they had car accidents were knocked down by a car there were you know there was never a suicide it just didn't happen mm. now maybe it wasn't reported we didn't see it but now I, I you know a friend of mine her her uh best friend's son taking their own life sadly in front of a train um and i i knew some of the train drivers and i uh, i bumped it was a guy who was a former train driver who left because he had uh he he had um, sadly hit somebody who had uh, taken their own life, and and he said, "Oh, where did it took place? Oh yeah, yeah, I know my mate. Yeah, he was the driver, uh, and and nice. what the drivers do. So there's a whole tragedy just percolates and multiplies." Yeah. But I do think it's really important to open the conversation because I think Northern Ireland, we we do know, and and in Ireland, the Republic, you know, there are very high suicide rates and and certainly are the norm. But I think it's always better to keep it in the light rather than the dark. Mm. OK, well, listen, um, that was, uh, you know, that that report, whatever else is, is very uh, it's a, a good window into what was happening in and around Noah's life in the kind of weeks before he died. And we can see uh, both the happen- happiness and a little bit of the sorrow that he was experiencing. And maybe we're all like that <laughs> every week of our lives. We have both. But um, well, look, maybe I'll try and come up and uh, we could uh, walk the beat up there. I haven't seen that drain. I still try to imagine it. And I think that's the shocking thing, right? Because yeah. it's- this isn't just a mystery about a confused kid and super bright and, and obsession with, with Noah. When you see the storm drain and when mm. you see where it is and where he cycled, you're thinking, how did this kid ever find this? Even if you went over there, it's not an obvious place to go. You know, it was locked the week beforehand. How do we know that, you know, how did he mm. know it was open? Did he know? Was it happy sense? So the decision making process, how he got there randomly is just like, like uh Baffling. Oh, yeah. How? And it's only when you actually see it on the ground that you become, oh, my goodness, really? Is this the answer? And you think, of, wow, what a question, because you just simply it's incomprehensible. But of course, these things also happen. But certainly it's one of the key reasons why the family were very skeptical uh, 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 at the start. The other reason why the family were very skeptical is that, <clears throat> you know, when there were a few witnesses, you know, good people, you know, ordinary people on Father's Day who saw Noah cycling by and um, did not cry and holler to the PSNI, which mm. I would have done 
many people have done in that community. I think there's a reluctance to engage with the police in anything or even to get themselves involved because in the troubles, you know, putting yourself into these kind of issues really were very problematic. Maybe that's a throwback. You know, uh, they gave their reasons. They thought it was a, a Father's Day prank, you know, and uh, and I think the family naturally were just j- just taken aback mm. by the community. And this is, you know, but good community, good people, fathers, sons and all of this stuff. And yet, uh, they they didn't do it was the error of omission uh, which really confused the family and throw in um uh, you know the concerns about sectarian stuff the history which i i don't put any uh, merit onto but I, and i think is really dangerous and combustible but i think abstracting from that you know there are it's kind of really real key anomalies and all these anomalies are just simply not helped by, I would imagine, uh, and I, I, you know, I think it's been admitted, you know, some key failures by the PSNI. I absolutely believe if the PSNI had dotted the I's and crossed the T's at the early days, then a lot of our conjecture now, or particularly the concern about third party intervention would be alleviated. And I think that's the key thing about it. When you don't know an answer, you know, the police still have to follow the protocols. They can't presume. So the failure to do basic policing well during the week when no one was missing, I think, has fundamentally hampered the investigation and may be a, a possible reason why we might never truly know what happened in this case. OK, well, we'll leave it at that for the moment. And I think our thoughts are, as always, with the family and friends of Noah and anyone touched by his loss. And particularly yeah. this, the third anniversary of his passing and disappearance. Okay, Donald McIntyre, thank you very much.